Good evening. On behalf of Boulder Community Health, the Boulder Rotary Club, Boulder Valley, Valley Rotary, and Mental Health Partners, I'd like to welcome you to the third program in our education series, spotlighting important men mental health concerns impacting the Boulder community. I'm Dee Perry, Chair of the Board of Directors for Boulder Community Health, more commonly referred to as BCH. BCH is one of only two remaining independent hospital systems in the state of Colorado. Our local volunteer board of directors has deep ties to our community. Our independence and in-depth understanding of our community gives, uniquely positions us to provide services that are, reflect our local values and our local priorities. Our approach to mental health services is a very good example of the value of our independence. Mental health is an issue impacting every community in the state of Colorado. Unfortunately, many health systems do not provide critical mental health services. BCH operates the only general hospital in Boulder County that provides inpatient mental health services and we're committed to expanding those services. We're currently constructing a new building at our Foothills campus to house an expanded mental health unit. And we've added mental health counselors to our care teams in our primary care clinics. Our community needs and deserves mental health services and BCH is committed to responding to this need. To further demonstrate our commitment to mental health care, the BCH Foundation has started a multi-million dollar mental health endowment that already has close to 400 donors who either have personal experience with mental health issues or simply understand the significant gap in mental health care in our community. We all have a role to play in supporting those with mental health issues, which often drain our resources and our spirits. We can make a difference, however, through our own personal involvement and collaboration with others in the community. I want to personally thank those who are collaborating this evening to make this event possible. Boulder Rotary Club, Boulder Valley Rotary Club, Mental Health Partners, and Boulder Community Health. Thank you all. And now, here to introduce our speakers, is Constance Holden from Boulder Valley Rotary Club. Thank you, Dean. Before I introduce Dr. Deanna Bell, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that there is a table in the back um, that Mental Health Partners is hosting, and there is some wonderful, they're waving back there, there's some wonderful materials back there, and I would encourage you to stop by. There's also a table over here that the Boulder Community Health Foundation um, is hosting, and you may want to stop by there and speak with Grant Besser, who's the president of the um, Boulder Community Health Foundation. And, Grants in the back of the room there. So I met Dr. Deannabel about 20 years ago. How about that? I time. think we both didn't have gray hair then. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And um, I, was, I had the honor of serving on the advisory board um, of what was then the rape crisis team. And now that organization is called MESA, Moving to End Sexual Assault. And I was actually on the advisory board when we made that name change. Mm -hmm. So that was an exciting and interesting time. This, the topic this evening, I, don't, I do not believe would have been addressed a decade ago because there just wasn't the depth of understanding that people like Dr. Deannabel have made um, possible. She has been one of the leaders in this whole field of trauma-informed care and has really brought it to our attention. She is a licensed psychologist and a nationally recognized expert in sexual assault, neurobiology of trauma, secondary traumatic stress, and treatment of survivors. She currently serves as the Director of Trauma Services at Mental Health Partners. 
Through her private consulting and training practice, Dr. Deannabelle has provided guidance on trauma issues in over 30 states to prosecutors, law enforcement officers, military personnel, child welfare workers, and university staff. As a faculty member of the National Judicial Education Program, she has educated judges on the ways of ensuring defendants' rights. She has provided expert testimony in over 60 civil and criminal sex assault trials across the front range. Additionally, and I think this is worth noting, she's a registered yoga teacher specializing in trauma-informed yoga. So I don't want to take up any more of Janine's time. Thank you, Connie. Thank you so much. I think I'm mic'd up here, so I don't need this. OK, I don't need that. Um, oh my goodness, Connie doesn't look a day older than 20 years ago when we came up with that new name. Um, good evening everybody, I'm Janine, and it is uh, truly an honor. I was so excited for this night because as Connie said, I have the privilege of traveling all over the country and talking, and sometimes I just feel like I don't do it enough in Boulder County. <laughs> so here I am, it feels, uh, feels really good to be with you. So thanks for taking your Wednesday night to be here with me. Before I get to, so we're obviously going to talk about a, t a topic tonight about emotional trauma, which is and can be a pretty heavy topic, and it can bring up a lot of feelings, particularly for those of us who have experienced some of the traumatic events that I might mention. So... For, because of that, we've brought Alyssa in the back. Alyssa, you want to wave? Alyssa is one of our amazing volunteer hotline counselors with Moving to End Sex Assault. So if at any time anybody needs an ear, wants to touch base, a feeling that you get um, triggered by any of the content, Alyssa is here both during and after so, uh, so that we all can feel supported in that tonight. So... Okay, I'm just going to dive right in because I don't have a lot of time and I have a lot to say. So we talk a lot about trauma. It's, it's a word that gets used a lot, right? That Broncos loss and that Super Bowl was traumatic, <laughs> right? We said that or, you know, I, uh, oh, the Whole Foods parking lot is true. That might actually be true, right? <laughs> I don't know. It might actually be true. But we, we use the word a lot. We hear trauma, but what is it? What does it mean? So I like to think of trauma on this continuum, what I call the stress trauma continuum. And we start out with just stress, right? Does anybody in here have any stress? No, they sent me to the wrong auditorium? No? no? <laughs> right. Of course, right? We all have what we know as normal stress, things we deal with in our life every day that are stressful, such as what? Give me something that's stressful. Driving, traffic. What else? What's that? Taxes. Okay, yeah, that taxes. That's going to come under actually number two. I'm going to talk about that. But Traffic, bills, politics, politics. <laughs> exactly, children or relationships, that's different. That's a different category. We'll talk about that. So think about it. Finances, relationships, right, politics, that's in our everyday life. And my guess is we have figured out some ways to cope with that stress and distress. We have strategies that we use to get through it, right? For instance, if I have a really stressful day at work, my go-to is get home, walk my dog, get something reasonably healthy to eat, go to yoga if I can squeeze it in, and then get a good night's sleep. If I can do even like two of those things, I'm usually good to go in the next, the next day, okay? We have coping skills that are, we're up for the task of meeting that stress threshold, right? Now, 
Situational stress is when the stress gets a little more intense, a little more acute, but we also know that it's not going to last forever. So, perfect example of that is what you said, ma'am, taxes, tax season. Stressful leading up to that. We know we have a deadline. We got to get it done. We got to, you know, but we know it's going to end at some point. It has an end date, right? What else is an example of a situational stress? Combat, certainly. Well, again, that might fall more under the latter category. So let's save that thought. What else is situational with a, with a clear end date? Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, like if you have a medical procedure, right? Or like a, or you're sick, you have an illness of some kind. You know, you know you're going to get better. It's not a life-threatening illness, but it's acutely stressful, right? Okay. This is actually the time when a lot of people seek extra help, extra support. They seek out friends, family. They might seek out um, help with their minister, pastor, rabbi at that time, priest. Or they might seek counseling at that time to help get through kind of a stressful period. Then we have the third bullet point up here, traumatic stress. So what is an example of traumatic stress? Well, sir, you said combat. Absolutely. What else? And we'll talk about why. Sexual assault, sexual abuse. Good. What else? D divorce under some circumstances, absolutely. Yes, what else? Being stalked. Being stalked. Very good. So, now, let's say, let's take one of those examples, right? Um, active military, combat, military. So if I am engaged in combat, I'm deployed, and I'm out on the front line fighting in combat, do you think me just going back to my barracks and walking my dog and getting something good to eat and I'm going to wake up the next day fine? Right. Our normal coping, kind of, it's, we don't have exactly the right tools for the job. Our normal coping can get overwhelmed by those things. We don't wake up the next day necessarily feeling better. Does that make sense? Does any, you know, uh, Connie mentioned like school shootings, right? They can, they can impact the way we feel, our worldview, feeling safe, feeling secure. That's beyond just regular stress. Now we're in the trauma zone. So that's what I, that's what we're going to focus on. So we kind of, we have two different kinds of trauma. One is what we call shock trauma, which overwhelms the ability to cope um, where there is either a real or perceived threat to our life or a sense of bodily integrity, okay? So we're really worried of, am I going to survive this? Could I be harmed in a way where my life is at risk? In those examples you just gave me, sexual assault, military combat, stalking, those are all realities, Okay, and this piece is a person's not really able to bring the body and mind back into balance when the day, when the uh, event is over. That's what I mean, that you just don't wake up and feel ready to go the next day after you live through something traumatic. It infects us much more long-lasting, in a long-lasting way. Okay, so there's shock trauma. So think bodily safety, things like that, accidents, right? We'll talk more. Then you have something called developmental trauma. And developmental trauma is more complex because it's not necessarily one single thing that happens that's a traumatic episode. It's a little more subtle and it's defined as chronic misattunement between a child growing up and the primary caregiver. And let me give you an example about what that means. Let's consider a child 
who grows up in an alcoholic family, okay? And the child is being a kid, right, doing kid things, but the parent, let's say one parent, let's say the father is, has an alcohol problem and is either consumed with his drinking or actively using alcohol, how can the father possibly attune to what the son needs, right? So I'm not talking about violent, violent abuse here, although that's certainly one form of trauma. I'm talking about a chronic misattunement or unavailability in the parental or the caregiver-child bond. Does that make sense? So we refer to that as developmental trauma. So there's chronic kind of abuse or neglect or other adversity, like one of the caregivers, um, like I said, either maybe having a mental illness or using substances. And it looks a little different than normal post-traumatic stress. People, because, yeah, I'll talk about that in a minute. Hold that thought. So these are examples, and we talked about that. These are some examples of other traumatic events. So physical, sexual abuse, neglect, domestic violence, stalking, school or gang violence, severe motor vehicle accidents, serious medical conditions that have the potential to be life-threatening, military combat, immigration. Why is immigration up here? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, it is traumatic. It is traumatic, and it's traumatic in a couple ways. It could be the actual process of what somebody physically had to do to immigrate, right? What, what steps did they have to take? What danger did they encounter in that immigration process? And then once the person lands, wherever they're landing, you have issues around loss of language, loss of culture, maybe not being welcomed by the dominant culture in which they land, right? So all of those adds up to a trauma. So when we have immigrants among us in our community, we have to know that a traumatic experience is with them as well, okay, most, in most cases. Natural disasters like, for example, the flood that we had in 2013 here, certainly a piece. And then this last one, chronic expression experiences of oppression or marginalization. Interesting. What do I mean? Does anybody want to guess, like, what's an example of that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Homelessness. Good. What else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, racial, people, racial discrimination, right? Or people who experience any discrimination based on their sexual identity, race, um, yeah. Being bullied, absolutely. Homeless is a great example. Or people who are mentally ill. People with mental illness who are stigmatized and marginalized not once, but probably regularly, right, throughout their lifetime. Okay, so this, and by all, no means is it this an exhaustive list. These are just some highlights. And the thing they have in common is that there is a real threat to life, to bodily integrity, or to identity. That definitely supersedes a bad traffic jam trying to get to work, right? That's, this is a whole different level, and this is what trauma is. Yes, ma'am? A, a real or perceived threat to life, to bodily integrity, or to identity. Okay, yes, sir? No, it's a, yeah, it's a good question. Whoops, I'm not allowed to walk up there. Sorry. Hard for me. It's hard. Um, he said, is, is it real or imagined? Here's the thing. It's a real or perceived threat. 
someone could perceive, you know, you and I could experience the exact same thing. If you and I were sitting here and all of a sudden um, a shooter came through the door back there, I might get really scared. You may not, right? Um, so it's how a person perceives an event is what makes it traumatic rather than me from the outside defining it for someone else. Does that make sense? No. It can be. I mean, and you get into a real fuzzy area, like if someone, but here's the thing, if somebody even is imagining something terrible happening to them, or let's say somebody is in a psychotic state, it's still traumatic because they're still experiencing that even if it's not quote unquote real. Does that make sense? It's a great question. It's an excellent question. It's super nuanced. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a good question. That's a totally different category, but it's up there. I mean, it's up there and it's certainly traumatic. I mean, we're, we're looking at like annihilation possibilities, right? So I think that's in there. This is in the mix of, of trauma, which leads to this last bullet point here. Especially in today's society and media and what's kind of in the air, how many of you have either witnessed or heard about any of the above? Raise your hand. Okay, look at that. Almost the whole room of the JCC auditorium was raised. So what does that say? What does that say about us? <laughs> we, we could have some degree of secondary trauma, right, from the things we hear or witness and read about. So we could have primary trauma if we ourselves experience these, and we could have secondary trauma if we've heard about, read about to the point where we feel impacted by it. Now, not everybody is impacted the same way, and you might watch the news and be totally fine, and I might watch the news and have a trauma response. It just depends. It just depends. But the potential for secondary trauma is there when we're exposed to this in our life. Okay? Yeah. I think I get your question. Let me repeat it and see if I got it. So are you kind of saying, are you saying that if someone has a, already have a trauma experience, the pump is primed? No. Well, absolutely. The, the whole idea is that our pump is primed, you know, for, for experiencing all these, all these things in, in an intense way. So absolutely. And here's the thing. Does anybody recognize this picture and know where this picture came from? September 11th, okay, 2001. So look, look at the expression on these people's faces, right? These, these three in the foreground here. If you had to say what their affective experience was in the moment here, what they were feeling, what, how, what would you say they were feeling? Shock, disbelief, fear, horror. Okay, hang on, stop. Shock, disbelief, fear, horror. Notice that nobody said upset, right, or stressed. This is trauma. Those are the core components that at least of the time that the event was occurring, shock, fear, disbelief, horror was happening at some level, right? And these people's face capture that. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. 
In today's technology, if we put PET scans on these people, okay, do you know what a PET scan is? Posit positron emission topography scan, or something called an fMRI, a functional MRI, okay, where we can actually see what the brain is doing under certain, under certain things, we would see very different things happening in these people's brains than we, we would see in normally stressed people. And those neurobiological changes that happen in the brain, guess what? It stays in the brain unless it's kind of processed and moved out. And that's why someone said, when you say trauma, you don't really get over these things, right? You don't, if you experience one of these things, you know, whoops, you don't wake up. If you have a serious medical condition and you're diagnosed with a very serious cancer that's fast growing, you're not just like, okay, I got this diagnosis, well, I'll just... My life will go back to normal. No, th it, things change because of these traumatic experiences. And the brain and the body change, right? And we're going to talk about then how people respond. So let's just look at this for a minute. This, these statistics are quite staggering. About 70% of all adults have experienced at least one traumatic event. So imagine 70% of this room, right? And my personal opinion is that might be under, under uh, rated, right? It might be uh, not an accurate number because somebody might not define something as traumatic, right, all the time. So it could be higher. About half of our children in today's population have experienced at least one childhood trauma. Think about that. 34, almost 35 million kids that have either had some form of abuse, neglect, maybe they've witnessed domestic violence, right? Other kinds of accidents, medical conditions, it's a lot. And then nearly a third of all youth ages 12 to 17 have experienced two or more. So a third, two or more. So the numbers are staggering, staggering. And then it impacts, I think the thing about trauma is it impacts all these areas. First of all, the neurobiological changes that happen in the brain are profound. So in other words, I'm going to talk a little bit more, but the brain structures, the neurotransmitters, some of the brain structures themselves change under traumatic stress, particularly in children. Well, actually, particularly in children and adolescents, because why? Their brain is still developing, right? So if their brain is still developing and they experience a traumatic event, the brain starts wiring and firing around that trauma, and that's a traumatized brain, right? Because we know the brain is still developing to about age, you know, 24, 25, 26. So trauma in that time, but particularly if it's zero to five years old, extreme acute time of developmental growth neurobiologically. So if a trauma happens it's likely to have pretty serious impact. It impacts the way we feel about the world, about ourselves and beliefs that we have about the world, ourselves, other people, particularly if the trauma was interpersonally based, right? That's gonna impact a, a lot of things around trust and intimacy. It impacts physical health. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Relationship, behavior. You know, it's kids who then will act out in school or show behaviors that sometimes mimic another diagnosis called what? ADHD? Okay. Little soapbox, my opinion. 
We are overdiagnosing ADD and ADHD, and we are underdiagnosing trauma. Yes, and I used to think this was a Colorado thing. You know, I travel all over the country, and it is everywhere. And we go to kids because we see impulse control problems, or act, you know, acting out, or some some violent problems, or can't focus in school, can't concentrate. Yes, absolutely. ADHD is a real diagnosis that some people are diagnosed. I mean, it's it's a viable diagnosis for some, but we're using it as a catch-all. Because kids with trauma will present that exact same way, right? And we also diagnose ADHD a lot because why? Because you can fix it a little more easily, right? It sells less drugs, yeah. Whereas you can't fix trauma as easily. So we go to something to try to fix something when in fact it could contribute, right, to the, the trauma symptoms. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Questions? Comments on that? Sir? How do you know? Yeah. Great question. He said, if they present in a similar way, how do you tell it apart? Right. Well, most lay people cannot. They would need a kind of intensive psychological assessment to really flush out the circumstances, the history, to be able to make an accurate diagnosis. History will tell you a lot. But, and I, uh, so it's, it's tricky, but we see it all the time. Uh, impacts memory, all these things, all this pinwheel. So, uh-oh, I'm stuck. I'll have to manualize it. Okay. There we go. All right. So, then, once somebody is exposed to traumatic stress, I don't know, that's okay, I don't mind doing it manually if that doesn't work. Um, so, not everybody, so you've heard of post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Have you heard of that? Does anybody know where that diagnosis started or came from or how we started talking about that? It's actually even before Vietnam. World War II. World War I, for sure. But World War II is when the term shell-shocked veterans, do you remember that? People were coming back from, from Europe and they were saying shell-shocked. And that kind of stood for a long time. It stood, you know, what was that, the 40s? And so it stood for many years of just somebody was shell-shocked. That was about as far as we went, <laughs> right? Then, interesting, in the 70s, all these um, rape crisis centers and child advocacy centers started springing up around the country, right? By the way, moving to end sexual assault right here in Boulder County, my agency is the third rape crisis center that started in the country, which is pretty cool, in Boulder, so in 1972. Um, so then they started seeing all these women and children who looked very similar to these, these veterans that were coming back. They had the same presentation of looking a little, quote unquote, shell-shocked. So then from there, we started talking it, about it as a post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, I don't really love calling it that. I much prefer to call it post-traumatic stress because there is nothing disordered about the way somebody responds if they've encountered in horrendous violence, if they were abused and neglected. It's a normal response to abnormal events. Does that make sense? So I encourage you, just changing the language to post-traumatic stress response. Did we get that goal? No? I don't know. It's not working. That's okay. Um, so 
the, so I'm not going to go into this. This kind of talks about how to meet the diagnostic criteria for PTS. And it's basically when people keep re-experiencing the trauma through memories or flashbacks, nightmares, their nervous system is on high alert. And we call that persistent increased arousal. Have you ever been stressed out, right, or on edge, and like somebody at work like slams a door and you <laughs> jump out of your chair, right? I've certainly been there. So when arousal is higher, it doesn't take much to kind of set off that system. So somebody could respond with more anxiety, with anger, with irritability, okay? These are all potential um, responses. Okay, other symptoms, disturbance in sleep, irritability, difficulty concentrating. And notice here, again, irritability, outbursts of anger, difficulty concentrating, being on edge, that can look a lot like ADHD. You know what else, it, what else can it look like in adults? What's the other diagnosis for adults that has some similarity to this? Anxiety, yes, but the diagnosis. Have you heard of bipolar disorder? Okay, this is another disorder that gets over-diagnosed, PTSD underdiagnosed. okay? We, and again, there's like, okay, what we were focused on maybe what more people are doing rather than what happened to somebody. Okay, all of these are related to dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So look at this. So what the autonomic nervous system is the part of the brain, right, and bodily functions that happen automatically, such as what? What happens automatically in our bodies that we don't have to think about? Respiration, heart rate, good. Digestion, those are good. The way the pupils dilate or not. Okay, those are all automatic, autonomic responses. Trauma disrupts the autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. It whacks it out, okay? And then for some people, then, the nervous system gets stuck on on. And by on, I, that they can look hyperactive, anxiety, panic, irritability, anger, even rage, just always not, you know, looking behind their shoulder, never feeling quite safe where they are. Does that make sense? Oh, good. Yay, fixed. Oh, okay. And then sometimes the nervous system gets stuck on off. And then that looks really different, like depression, flatness, numbness, Dissociation, do you, do you, are you familiar with that term? So dissociation means like you're there in your body, but your mind is like not here, right? You're not present. You like check out, go away. It's actually an extremely helpful coping mechanism during traumatic stress to dissociate, right? It's super helpful because if this is really scary or life-threatening or uncomfortable, Checking out, going away, is a good way to deal with that. Where it becomes problematic is then you're, you're at work and your boss comes in and is like, okay, come on, we got to get this paper out by Friday, and um, there's stress, and then the dissociation response comes. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So let's see. Wait, I'm going to make sure I have the right thing in here, I don't wanna turn it off. Okay, so then, okay, so stuck on on, stuck on off. So what do people then do? If think about if your nervous system and you didn't really have control over it, was stuck in one of these places and you weren't really regulated. <laughs> regulated would be that place where you just feel a centered, calm, 
even under stress, you can manage, you can think, right? Most of us do not hang out there all the time, <laughs> right? We have our moments of being out of the zone, but we at least know what the regulated zone feels like, right? With trauma, it, people often kind of stay there and they could cycle back and forth. So then people want to find a way to adapt to being in one of these situations. So then they start engaging in different things like drinking, using drugs. Now, hang on, before I go further, think about it. If your nervous system is stuck on on and you can't relax, you're anxious, you're panicky, you're, you can't settle in, how do you think you're going to feel after a couple glasses of wine? Better. Okay? It works short term. But then the problem is, as we know, alcohol doesn't stay in our system forever. And then when it goes out, sometimes we can be more anxious than when it came in, right? And then we need more alcohol to settle our system down, and that's the pattern of addiction, okay? Trauma and substance abuse are like this. They go hand in hand. Because of people are trying with the best skills that they have, the best tools at their disposal to regulate, right? So oftentimes, oftentimes, not always, sometimes substance abuse can occur totally on its own, okay? But oftentimes, there's an underlying trauma that people are trying to regulate, Right? So I'm using the example of wine, but what about if somebody's stuck off? If somebody's dissoci you know, dissociated, flat, and numb, what do you think from a substance abuse perspective? What do you think works here? Exactly. Stimulants. Like what? Meth. Meth. Cocaine. Right. So here it is, right? It's, it's people trying to solve a problem. And the problem is a dysregulated autonomic nervous system, okay? And so, okay, so the trick is to help people find other ways to regulate that system. There's other things that happen, self-harm and suicidal gestures. Are you familiar with people who self-harm, right? Cutting, burning in some way, super common, with trauma survivors, particularly people who have been sexually abused. Because, whoops, hang on. If you're down here, if you're stuck on off and you're not feeling anything, you know what my clients tell me is that when they cut, what happens? They start feeling something. Oh, I start feeling. Because think about it. You cut, you inflict a wound to your body, start releasing endorphins, I start like feeling alive a little bit, right? So you can see the pattern. But of course, like, it's dangerous. And the more people cut, it can get worse and worse and worse and more lethal. And then people have to cut deeper, it can be very bad. But I want you to leave here with a new understanding of that because I've heard a lot of people say, well, he or she is cutting and it's manipulation or they're trying to get attention, right? Oftentimes, they're trying to solve a problem, which is to regulate their system without knowledge of how to do it in any other way. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. Yes, yes. The question was, can you like flip-flop? Can you go up and down between stuck on and stuff? Absolutely. Some people predominantly stay on, some off, and some can cycle. Great question. Okay, so other adaptations, substance abuse, self-harm, sexual acting out. You know, sexual acting out is a great way to get out of stuck off, right? Has big consequences, of course, right? major consequences, but works in the moment. Hyperarousal, other high-risk behaviors like criminal activity or 
doing adrenaline rushy kind of things, dissociating, acting out, eating disorders too as a way of adapting. So this then, then here's the thing. If people start using these as their tools for coping, we start just focusing on these things and we forget about what's underneath. Like, what happened that they're doing these things? Does that make sense? Okay. So this is a model. It's called the triune brain model, which is very simplistic. As you can tell, the brain is not this simplistic. But, you know, our prefrontal cortex right here is really when we are in our wise mind, right? It's analytical. It's sequential. It's like, what can I learn? We're analyzing. The middle part of the brain it's called the insula cortex, part of the limbic system in blue, relates to attachment, our connection to other people, how we do in relationships. And then this survival state, this brainstem, is all about, am I going to survive? How do I live? How do I eat? How do I reproduce? It's very, very kind of primal, okay? It's called the reptilian brain for a reason. It's very... Primal, primitive, okay? Now, what do you think during traumatic stress, what part of the brain do you think is activated? Brainstem, survival state. What am I going to do? How am I going to get out of here? Am I going to be harmed? Am I going to die? Okay, hardcore survival state. So what happens when this part of the brain is activated these other parts of the brain go offline. They don't even function that well. For example, in the middle part, somewhere, I don't know, somewhere around that blue section, we have an area called Broca's area of the brain. It has to do with speech. So under certain traumatic stress for some people, if this is activated, speech goes out the window, right? See a lot of head nods. And then trying to remember the event, well, the, look how far away, like literally, look how far away the prefrontal cortex is from this brainstem. So getting it to integrate into memory is really difficult. And that's why sometimes people don't remember the specifics of what happened to them, or they can't recall it in a sequential, chronological way. Right? Does that make sense? And then what Part of, well, for example, what Mesa deals with is then if a survivor makes a report to law enforcement and their story keeps changing, one time they say this, one time they say that, what's sometimes, what could someone lend to believe about that? They're making it up. Thankfully, we have great law enforcement officers who have been trained and we have really worked with them to understand that that's just tr that's traumatic memory that's how memory works under trauma does that make sense yes ma'am okay, yes Yes, ma'am. Great question. She said, sometimes you keep reliving it, right? You keep going over the trauma over and over. And every time that happens, right, you're reactivating this brainstem, right? And so every time there's a flashback or a nightmare or intrusive thought, we can, we can go back there. And, and see, just as I'm talking about this, for those of us in the room that have traumatic experiences, I hope this helps us feel normal because <laughs> it's not, this isn't necessarily in our control what happens here, right? But what is in our control is what we do to heal it because the amazing thing about this, I know I'm kind of taking you down this sorry road of like, oh my gosh, brain, blah, blah, blah. This can be healed. Right? There is something called neuroplasticity, which says that new neural connections can be made and certain parts of the brain can get reactivated and certain parts of the brain can get quieted down based on things we do. And I'm going to tell you about what those things are in a minute. I'm not going to steal my own thunder on them. Okay. So 
Um, how am I doing on time? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go a little faster but just because I'm getting close to time. Okay, ha has anybody in here heard about this? Adverse childhood experience study. Okay, good. So you could Google this for more information. It's one of the best studies that's been ever, ever done on trauma. And what it was done actually by Kaiser, it was sponsored by Kaiser Permanente and some researchers where they studied 17,000 members of Kaiser Permanente in San Diego County. Okay, so think about that. Okay, those are people who had insurance, San Diego County, you know, probably at least middle class, probably moderately to highly educated group. Okay. And they asked questions to determine their ACE score. They asked 10 questions. Have you ever experienced recurrent physical or emotional abuse, sexual abuse? Did you grow up in a household with alcohol or drugs, a family member being imprisoned, a mentally ill or chronically depressed or hospitalized member? A mother, some of this, like, I don't really love the language in this because it could also be father being treated violently, but this, this was their language in the study, or both biological parents absent. So they asked these questions, and then you got an ACE score from zero to 10, okay? First of all, what do you think the average ACE score was for these 17,000 people in Kaiser, the average, yeah, it was four, okay? That's high, that's high. And then they did all this study. So like, for example, trauma's connection to substance abuse. They found that the higher the ACE score, look, look at the ACE score as it goes up, and the percentage that that client or that person met the diagnostic criteria for alcoholism. Right, so the more traumas, the higher risk for substance abuse. Look at this, trauma underlying other mental health issues. Um, so higher the ACE score, they're looking at over here, um, chronic depression, okay? The higher the ACE, the more likely for the depression. So here's the thing, in my personal bias and what my career has been devoted to, is that often depression and anxiety, yes, they exist. But the reason they exist is the trauma underneath it. And unless we're treating that, I don't know how far we're getting. Right? Okay? And then uh, look at this. They looked at ACE score and indicators of impaired work performance. So like ab absenteeism, financial problems, problems performing jobs. The higher the ACE score, the more those things, the, the performance are impaired. So it has all these consequences, right? All these consequences. So check it out, ACE study. It's, it, it's validating in some way. It means that trauma is behind a lot of our health problems, our medical problems, our social problems, Right? They did, there's another slide, I didn't put it on here, but like the, the percentage chance that somebody will uh, commit domestic violence goes way up as the ACE score goes up. So adverse childhood experiences, traumatic experiences are a big deal. So we have got to shift the paradigm. We've got to get away from asking what's wrong with people, because in this slide right here, this is what's wrong with people. We gotta move past that, and we have to start asking what happened to you. Yeah. It's part of looking at that question. We know there are people who have seen or experienced Terrible trauma. Yes. Immigrants, police, comics, yes. whatnot. Yep. And they don't go into this dysregulated state. 
So are you working or are there studies? Now, what's going on with these people that may be translatable? To the ones that go off yeah, it's a good it's a good question. The essential question is: there are some people that experience trauma that don't go to the dysregulated states, right? And some people do. Here's the thing: that here's the the answer I like to give to this, right? So it really has to do with individual. It has to do with genetics. It has to do with coping and how resilient they are and how much access they have to resources. To help, right? Yep, right. But that's right. But sometimes people don't have their their coping might be to grab a thing of wine, right? Yeah. So you got to learn new skills. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, certainly a supportive family network is huge, and ha not having trauma in the background is huge, right? It serves a nice base. So, okay, here's the thing. We're gonna play a little game. I want you to listen soon, as soon as Amy um, plays this and tell me what this tune is. Whoa, they're fast. All right, fine. All right. See, this is good. I, you know, I like it because a lot of the crowd is over like age 45. We, we remember Mr. Rogers. Okay, so. Do you remember, I, I love Mr. Rogers, actually. Do you remember, there's this quote that, that Fred said, which I love. And he says, when I was a boy, I would see scary things in the news. And my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You'll always find the helpers. Right? So... The purpose of this presentation, and even of me being here tonight, is to know now you can be helpers. Based on what you now know and understand, maybe in a different way. So you are now the helpers. And if you need kind of other, maybe more professional helpers, look what we have. So I'm so proud of this. So in my career, this has kind of been my dream was to launch this program that we launched last May. And it's called Moving Beyond Trauma, Heal Healing Mind, Body, and Spirit. It's a program of mental health partners that has currently six therapists expertly trained to work with any kind of psychological trauma. And we've been working for about a year and I, it's amazing. Our outcomes for how we're seeing people work through the trauma are, have been uh, outstanding. We treat kids age four to older adult, no end, right? And we use evidence-based practices that are what we call trauma-focused. So my therapists, we don't do the hey, come into my office, hey, how you feeling today? We are focused on moving through the trauma it's a it's focused work and it's working which is really cool so there's information about that back there with elizabeth um, so you could check that out and then of course we have the rape crisis center moving to end sexual assault which specializes in sexual assault specifically Oh, and by the way, shameless plug, this is our fundraising event that's coming up that I believe was on your chair that's coming up April 5th. And when I say fundraising event, it's free. So it's not really, but we will have a silent auction and you can tour the facility and learn more about what trauma treatment we do, meet our therapists, and maybe bid on a silent auction item and help us stay in business so it's free so you should come and and we can talk more there um okay so here's when i said the brain can be rewired here's some things we know work and i'm going to talk about each one so meditation and mindfulness practices and you're like what how can that help it's been so researched that it actually shows that meditation and mindfulness can increase neuronal volume in the prefrontal cortex, right here, it's the frontal lobe, right? You're like, so what? 
Big deal. Neuronal volume in my frontal lobe. What's a big deal? It's a big deal. You know why? Because the thicker and more robust our prefrontal lobe is, the less influence our brainstem has on how we act. So it acts like it's like taking your car to get the brakes tuned up. Okay, and that's if we can get a good brake job on our prefrontal cortex, it can actually break some of the impulsivity or volatility or liability in the lower part of the brain. And, you know, people think of meditation, you have to sit on the cushion, you know, you have to breathe. No, anything can be a meditation as long as you're using mindfulness practices. What is mindfulness? What, how do you define that? It's three things. It's doing one thing at a time on purpose and paying attention to it. Think about that. One thing on purpose that you're paying attention to. So it could be breathing, right? You're sitting breathing and just paying attention to your breath. Guess what? It can also be cooking, but not cooking, have, talking on the phone, having the radio on, and like, you know, multitasking with uh, something else. I don't know, you know, feeding the kid, feeding the baby. Like, it's one thing at a time. You're like, I can't do that. Multitasking used to be considered sexy, okay? How much can I get done? How can I multitask? We have now learned that multitasking stresses out the brain. We've actually learned it has bad effects on the brain, right? So it's really hard to do one thing at a time. Think about when you get in your car, how many of you just get in your car and drive? Good. That's mindfulness practice. Okay, that's good. Right. But I'm talking no radio, no cell phone, no eating, <laughs> right? Doing one thing and paying attention. Walk, I used to walk my dog, and I'm, I love podcasts, so I listen to podcasts, right? But I realized I'm multitasking, right? I am so multitasking right now. So I still like my podcast, and I still will occasionally listen. But when I'm really stressed and I can feel my nervous system aroused, podcast off, walk the dog, mindfulness right here, right now, one thing at a time. It works to rewire the brain. Yoga. So Connie, I, I got to plug yoga and I could talk forever about yoga practice and trauma-informed yoga and what it does for the brain. There's amazing research that's coming out about how it helps re-regulate the nervous system. And you don't have to go to like vigorous, hot, vinyasa things. I mean, you can do that, and that's helpful, but even a slow practice meditative yoga focusing on breath and movement can work wonders, work wonders. Mesa, by the way, offers trauma-informed yoga classes. We're starting one in June. If anyone is interested in that, see Alyssa back there, right? Okay, slow conscious breathing, paying attention to breath, learning new things. When we learn new things, we, again, increase neuronal volume in our prefrontal cortex, right? We learn how to play the guitar. We're stimulating new neural connections that are not traumatized neural connections, right? Huge thing. And then last thing, see, this is Scout here. And I had to bring Scout in because um, Scout is a stand-in for our coming facility dog that we're going to be getting as part of the trauma center in, um, in May. So Scout is a temporary stand-in. But just connecting with presence of animals, nature, things that bring us into the moment, huge neurobiological benefit, lowering blood pressure, lowering triglyceride levels, right? Increasing limbic attachment to a safe thing, right? A safe being, because people are complicated. I mean, good attachments to people are good, but they're complicated. Um, 
And then finally, this. This is what you can do. How do how if people in your life you know you might encounter. First, just start by believing and validating their experience. Not trying to talk them out of it, not trying to convince them it was something else, but simply by believing. Understanding that the symptoms they might show are adaptations to the trauma and rooting down to have compassion versus judgment. Avoid blaming and minimizing, encouraging positive coping skills like exercise, yoga, time in nature. And then here's the thing, getting support for yourself if you're really close to a trauma survivor because you are then a secondary trauma survivor. Does that make sense? So you're impacted too. So even if whatever didn't happen to you, but you're close with someone who's going through something, get support for you too. And we'll treat you at Moving Beyond Trauma too, if you wanna, wanna come there. And then refer to the community resources we have, which are amazing. Oh my gosh, that's a lot. And I did pretty good. Any questions, thoughts? Janine, yeah. Oh, uh I've got a quick question yeah. for you. Yeah. For people that are high on the ACEs score, so yeah. this would be anybody that's four or above, and you know that, um, when they're working with someone and they're working through the trauma and you're looking for specifically someone that's going to work the trauma with them, how do you, can you talk a little bit about that process? Because there are lots of therapists that, they address everything but the trauma. It's a great question, um, St Steve, right, Steve? Yeah, it's a great question. So this is what I referred to earlier, that when you do trauma-focused therapy, okay, it's not, this is, it could not be pleasant, but we operate in the idea of a three-phase model. First, we try to establish safety, trust, make sure, see what person's coping skills are like. If they don't have good ones, we help them find good ones and practice them and use them. Stage one, depending on the person, could take a long time. Some people, it might take no time at all. Stage two is what you're talking about, and that is reprocessing the trauma. So what does that mean? It's going, we call it exposure. So it's someone literally remembering everything that they can remember about what happened and talking about it in detail and pairing memory with feelings with body. And it's a very active process, right? And it, we stay there as long as it takes. If it gets too much for somebody, we'll jump back to phase one, right? And then phase three, is then integration. How do you integrate this into your life, into your identity? How do you bring this in with your partner or your friends or whatever, like the, the integration? So it's a very focused treatment that uses techniques and narratives on this reprocessing that is very specific. Most general therapists don't have this training. They see people with trauma but they're falling back on like general psychology training, right? Which is good, but it's not great. And it's not great for this. Does that make sense? That was an excellent question, Steve. Yes, sir. Now I'll get to you. So, oh, you have the microphone. Hang on. I Go ahead. Mic. Yeah. <laughs> so um, if this is too personal, you don't have to answer it here. Yep. My son's just been diagnosed with PTSD and he's career military. Yes. And he has known for some time that he has a problem. And my son is very, he confides in me. I mean, he's asked my advice and he's been a great son. And yet on this one topic, he never got around to getting, to exploring it with yep. me. So I mentioned that to him and his, I'm wondering, you said earlier, if they've been diagnosed with PTSD, that they should challenge that diagnosis, or at least that's what I thought I heard you say. Mm -mm. No, ADHD is oh, I, yeah, oh, so, ADHD. Okay, well, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm way out of line because okay. my, my concern is that 
uh, he has known he's had an issue and he couldn't figure out what it was and now he's getting some help. So that's good. I thank mean, you. I, that's, that's great. What, if you get a good diagnosis, you can get help. I just hope if, as long as he's working with someone who can treat that issue well. The, the he's getting treatment through the military? Okay, good. Yeah. One thing that I found is really what you mentioned here. You get people that have a commonality in their, in their choices. Like I deal with uh, combat soldiers, probably dealt with maybe 500 of them by now, and most of those are PTS or military <laughs> sexual trauma. You get them together in multi-day outdoor experiences, and it seems they're their own best healers. Yes. Um, I've been told by the VA that these... These soldiers among themselves are better healers than what the VA can do with their therapy and their pharmaceuticals. Yeah, I think, I think, I think, it dep I, I agree. What he said, if for those of you who might not have heard it, was that um, there are several programs, some that I'm familiar with, taking military vet veterans, combat veterans, and doing kind of outdoor nature excursions in groups. I mean, you got two really healing things there. You have the collective. Right, because in trauma, people often think they're alone in this. Like, I'm alone. I don't know. I'm feeling what I'm feeling, and no one else is feeling this. So you have the connection, and then you combine that with connecting with nature. I absolutely agree that's a pretty powerful healer. And sometimes it is better than therapy for certain people. She is a question. Yeah. Hey. You did a great job. I Thank love you. listening to you. You're Thank my superhero. I wanted to elaborate a little bit on the ADHD, PTSD, bipolar, blah, yep. blah, blah. Yep. One of the problems, I think, in the healthcare industry, and as you know, I work in the prescriptive psychiatry yep. area, is that everyone is concerned about prescribing on label. So... Sometimes PTSD is like an umbrella diagnosis for a number of things it mimics and can change over time. But in order to medicate that cluster of symptoms, no one wants to go off label. So they, these folks with PTSD get so overdiagnosed. There's layer after layer after diagnosis as they move through borderline or bipolar or schizoaffective or dissociative so that they can defend the medication. And the goal of medications is simply to cool off the limbics or the prefrontal cortex so that the therapy does the healing. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to clarify mm -hmm. that there's a political pharma sort of reason sometimes for the overdiagnosis. Yeah, unfortunately, you're right. Thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. We do have a few therapists who are EMDR trained. Yes. EMDR, thank you. I get, forget some people. Are like, EMDR is called eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It's a therapeutic technique where you bilaterally stimulate the body, right? Either by watching eye movements or pulses that go right, left, right, left, or tapping as somebody is reprocessing the trauma. And it works on moving the trauma into different parts of the brain. The memories don't go away. They just calm down. The feelings around it, the intensity around it calms down. There's, I just want to say there's other techniques other than EMDR that do the same thing. EMDR everybody's heard of, and it, people ask for it, and it's good, but there's other things that work too. Yes? That was my question is, what is your opinion of the efficacy of things like EMDR, CBT, or other therapies in comparison to this one you're specifically referencing? Which one am I referencing? Yours. No, we use all those. You do? Oh, so that's part of your therapy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we're trained in EM, my clinicians are trained in EMDR, trauma-focused CBT, cognitive processing. We have a gamut of trauma-focused treatments, and it just depends on the individual, right? It depends on what is the best match for the individual. We don't go in. I don't go in and say, I'm going to do EMDR on everybody. We assess and we pick the best treatment to tailor to the individual. Yep. Yep. When people go through your program, 
what would be the average time frame from entry to exit? That's a good question. I mean, it depending, sometimes we'll treat what we call single incident traumas, like an accident or like, you know, a single kind of incident. Sometimes that treatment is done in as little as like two and a half months on weekly, weekly basis, right? Weekly therapy. So that would be probably the low end. Would sessions be in excess of an hour? One hour. One hour sessions weekly. And then the mid range that we see people is probably about five to seven, probably about six months in the mid range. And then of course there's a high range of people with very complex trauma that takes a little longer to treat. Yes, sir. How do you uh, change your treatment or approach for, say, children under 10 years? Yes, it's a great question. So children under 10 years. So, again, it depends. It depends on the kid. It depends on the circumstances. But we use a treatment called trauma, or, uh, yeah, trauma-focused CBT for kids. TFCBT is the acronym. And then depending, you know, depending on the age, there might be some general play therapy situations. And if the kid is young and not verbal, we might do that. As the kid ages, the TFCBT is really the gold standard in the industry for kids. Can you define yeah. CBT? Yeah. Um, so we're on a therapeutic uh, thing. Uh, CBT, CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy. So we work with thoughts, how thoughts contribute to behaviors. So we work on changing thoughts, right, for different behavioral outcomes. That's a very simplified version, but that's the gist. Yeah. Uh, does it really matter how much time has elapsed from the original trauma in terms of the treatment profile or its success? Great question. Okay. So I would say no, it doesn't matter, right? If a trauma happened 20 years ago and someone is coming in for treatment now, we would, we would, do, very, we would do similar things. We treat it in the same way, right? In terms of the success, I, I think it can be just, I don't have data. I don't have data on that that I could cite, but it, my sense is from anecdotes that I think about of people who have come through our clinic is we have great success. We had a woman come in that had a traumatic incident. She, she was probably in her 60s and she never told anybody about what happened, right? Never said it. And then you know what happened? She was a juror. She was selected for jury duty in Boulder County and she was on a child sexual abuse case, right? And it triggered some memories and then she came into treatment to work on that I mean, it had a, it probably was 50, 50 plus years old trauma, and she had great success. Yeah. But, Miss Pam? You? I would like to say that my own experience is that. Okay. I would like to personally say that from my own experience, I've had a trauma that's been going on for about 20 years and the very core part of it is actually from my birth and with working with the right person as a therapist who is trained more with what you're doing yep. is that I have finally been able to have an integration of things. I'm going to get choked up. <laughs> um, where my whole life is turning around. Oh, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Just, Good for you for doing that work, right? It's, yeah. it's never too late. That's what I want to say, basically. Yeah. It's, not, it's not too late. Oh, that's awesome. There's no substitute for doing I know. Good job. Lots of questions. All right, hang on. Hold. Oh, you hang on. Let's go here, and then I'll come back to you. Um, I work with uh, homeless families, most of which have been traumatized at some point in their lives. Yep. And I was wondering what kind of access would they have to your program? Uh, okay, the question was, she works with homeless families. Um, so we, people have to pay for services, so they have to either have insurance, Medicaid. If they have Medicaid, we take it. Medicare, commercial insurance, they can self-pay. So... Do some of your folks have Medicaid? Yes. Most oh, good. All of them. Do. Yep. Send them. Thanks. Yep. Moving on from the question just asked, in my view, 
particularly in high poverty zip codes, although not limited to that, we have almost infinitely more traumatized children than we have extensively trained staff to work with them, especially almost pro bono. So are there things that can be taught to people who are working almost at a lay level that could be um, proselytized or moved through a large system that could be helpful, or are we just going to leave the rest of the kids? No, I, I think the one, the thing that lay people can do always is that, as I described, that phase one creating safety, support, connection, relationship that is healing right? And we all have the ability to do that regardless of training. So just validating, seeing, uh, you know, nurturing and making connection, meaningful connection can literally we rewire the brain, right? Remember I said either with people, with animals. So that's what we can do. That's what we can do. Yep. How do people pay? What's your fee schedule, insurance, or whatever? So we should have information back there about what insurances we take, Medicaid, Medicare, multiple commercial insurances. Uh, I can't, you know, Anthem, United, Cigna. I mean, I can, I don't know all the top, off the top of my head. We also take TRICARE for veterans, military. Or you can self-pay. And it's a sliding scale based on income verification. Yeah. Uh, earlier there was a question about um, did it matter the time frame of when treatment was available I, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to clarify about especially with the ACEs study if kids get treatment early uh, we can prevent the comorbidities depression anxiety etc absolutely absolutely the earlier the better that we can get in and get treatment it's a great point yep sir Traumatized you. Sorry, but so if you're in a, if if there's a situation where the the there was a childhood trauma, and the the family's still intact, and the the abusive parent is still part of the family and is still doing things to people, you know, forty years later, that maybe aren't as extreme as what happened in childhood, but every time they happen, it seems like it takes people back. What do you do about that? I mean, how, do you just have to separate from that person or? I mean, what, what you're talking about is like living essentially with constant triggers, right? They're constant triggers of an abusive situation. So yeah, if, they're, if, if the person is still there in that system, abusing, offending, I think the answer is healthy boundaries with that. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean cutting off all contact. It could, it could, but healthy boundaries around not exposing, not exposing and like letting that perpet perpetration cycle kind of continue to impact, right? It's a great question. Yes. So I'm a nurse and I do risk reduction programs with teenagers and young adults that um, abuse substances. Yep. And um, as you were saying, a lot of trauma is involved with substance abuse. So yep. how can we, we have three, two or three sessions and that's it with each student. So do you have any advice on how we can? Yes, I do. I think if two or three sessions, I would focus on psychoeducation about trauma. Right? So it's simply like what it is, how it manifests, um, how it can show up and impact life, right? And just framing it for what it is, and then maybe starting about ways of, of how to start seeking healing around that. And re-regulating either through healthy, choosing healthy coping, getting into treatment, right? But I would be really going after the psychoeducation to, to name what you're seeing and to educate about what it is, how it impacts, that's where I'd go. Yep. Can I just respond to you? There's a community called Natural Five, which is focused on teens. 
You know that, yeah. Okay, I'm going to kind of pull this to a close, and I'm sure Janine can stay around for a little while in case some of you want to ask questions to her one-on-one. -on -one. There's a couple things we, you, that you picked up at the registration desk. One is a document called Call to Action. So some of you in this room are probably saying, what can I do to help with the mental health issues that are happening in our community? And this is a list of ways in which you can help. That's cool. And some of it is giving money, and some of it is giving your time. And then there's also what I think is a wonderful list of resources that we have in our community. And Diana Sherry, stand up for a minute. Diana and Bill Farrow spent hours and hours and hours pulling together a wonderful list of resources. And I also want to say this session was recorded. And so it will be available on the Boulder Community Help website. We also have recordings of the earlier sessions in case people miss those. Um, and we have two more sessions. There's one in April and there's one in May. And I think you all have the list of those. So pass the word to your friends and family and colleagues about this mental health series. And please join me in, in thanking Dr. Deanna Thank you, Donna. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure.